Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. In this episode, we discuss the weird and wacky dinosaurs that don't make the movies, and Alice Fraser finds out about her namesake, Allosaurus. Hello and welcome to Terrible Lizards. Now, we have covered a lot of ground already. This is, I believe, our sixth episode. And the thing is, we're here with a real-life paleontologist. He is real, aren't you, real, Dave? Uh, Yes, last time I checked. Yeah, exactly. So, (laughs) we've been covering quite familiar territory. T-Rex, Diplodocus. This episode, I thought, what I wanted to do is sort of of reach into the areas that you don't really get on a surface look at dinosaurs, that aren't really focused on in the museums and stuff. And, yeah, so I thought first thing we could begin with is place. Like, for me, as a dinosaur fan, it's very annoying that, you know, because when I was a kid I used to do this, is go out into the garden and dig for dinosaurs. But there are no dinosaurs in my back garden at all. It is very disappointing. And apparently in order to find a dinosaur, you need to go all the way to, like, Timbuktu or Outer Mongolia or some... Why? Why can't we find them in our gardens? Why do you have to go to Mongolia? If you're going to find a fossil, it needs to be eroded out of a landscape and therefore you need a place with lots of erosion rather than deposition and ideally not a lot of plants uh, and ideally where the land isn't occupied or being used for something and that yeah humans tend to live in river valleys floodplains yeah Yeah. so there's lots of soil there's lots of deposition uh, it's the opposite and so yeah we end up often in deserts or at least bad lands because land is cheap there's not a lot going on there's no one living there and Often there's loads and loads of erosion and therefore the bones are coming out. There, there are, I should say, there, there are some really cool fossil beds in relatively well inhabited places. Um, there is a fossil bed called the London Clay, which comes out in London. Um, it's not, it doesn't go back to the Mesozoic, but it's it's old stuff. These are true fossils. I thought, sorry, I thought that was all the submerged forests and that sort of thing that you get from, you know, after the Ice Age. Is that not? Uh, that's that's even more recent stuff. Okay, but yeah, I think yeah. The London clay is actually relatively okay. old. But I yeah, didn't know, that, but I didn't know things, there were dinosaurs in London as well. That's cool. If you, if you want a dinosaur from a city centre, we have one in the UK, which is Bristol. Ooh. So if anyone who knows Bristol well, if you carry on up Park Street and White Ladies Road to the very top of Bristol, there's a tiny little roundabout. And there's on the right hand side, there is a small quarry with Quarry Lane. Oh. And bones dug up there in the late 18, mid 1800s uh, eventually became called a thing called Thieker. Um, and this is colloqu- if you live in Bristol you may have come across the Bristol dinosaur there's a whole bunch more of theco material now not from Bristol from just outside still within the local area but the original bones were found within the city boundary basically of Bristol so you can occasionally get dinosaurs out of your back garden if you're in the right place it's a beautiful name a Thecodontosaurus yeah so it, it means socket toothed lizard or socket toothed reptile and, and actually all dinosaurs have socketed teeth as do crocodiles it's one of the things that distinguishes them and links these groups together by socketed socketed teeth you mean ones with only one root is that is that uh, that mean no it means there's there's literally a hole in the jaw that the tooth Ah. sits in actually very similar to us i mean this is what mammals have if all your teeth fall out you you see the holes where they sit but most reptiles by which obviously nowadays we mean lizards and snakes the teeth effectively sit on the jaw not in holes in the jaw but this is something that crocodiles crocodiles and dinosaurs and a bunch of other animals and this is what groups them all together one of the features that groups them all together have these sockets but Thecodontosaurus was basically the earliest fossil example of this and therefore it got the name because it was really quite strange to have discovered it oh, at the time so it's nothing to do with Jamie Theakston then not the time I'm aware of all, no. <laughs> <laughs> and anyone who's not British is gonna have no idea what I'm talking about. loads of people are British so you know we've got to have yes. a few in jokes True. in there um also British and born after the year 2000 and yeah, not yeah i was gonna say the other problem yeah maybe, <laughs> maybe date, dates us as well <laughs> apart from bristol though dinosaur fossils are miles from home so so you know where, where was the best place where in the world would you go if you were going to 
Mongolia is a, is a classic one. Um, and modern Mongolia and what we often call outer Mongolia, which is the Chinese, it's a region within China, but it used to be part of Mongolia. Hence, that's it's sometimes called outer Mongolia and Mongolia proper is called inner Mongolia. Um, some of the fossil beds extend across that border. So both sides are relevant in this, though it's Mongolia proper, as it were, that is perhaps the more famous and has some of the more exciting stuff. Uh, that's where the first dinosaur eggs, we talked about dinosaur eggs oh, yeah. last week. Um, it's a famous expedition there in the 1920s from the American Museum of Natural History, led by a guy called Roy Chapman Andrews, who is often incorrectly um, described as being the model for Indiana Jones. Um, he certainly looked like him and wore a Stetson oh, really? and wandered around in the desert and had adventures. Did he, he have was... a whip? No, but he was there in the Chinese Rebellion, so he sent back stories of, you know, being attacked and shot at by, you know, early biplanes and stuff like this. Um, but it appears to be an added on thing because people went back and went, hey, there's this guy from the 1920s who looks a little bit like how Indiana Jones dresses and was having these adventures in far off places. That was the model. He, he wasn't. But anyway, um, Mongolia, 1920s, first dinosaur eggs, Oviraptor on a nest, uh, first Velociraptor skeletons. Ooh. So that's where Velociraptors from. Uh, some of the early mammals, or so, so the first Cretaceous mammals, so certainly the first mammals from the Mesozoic, all came out of this expedition. Um, and so Mongolia became a bit of a hotbed fairly early on in dinosaur research. And then, of course, Mongolia became part of the Eastern Bloc. The Western scientists weren't getting in there. And no one was doing very much, except the Poles. So the, the Pol Polish paleontology has a massive tradition of working on dinosaurs. And therefore, actually, loads of Polish researchers were working in Mongolia in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And they maintain that tradition today. In fact, there's some lovely Mongolian fossils in Warsaw as a result of this. But weird, weird stuff has come out of Mongolia, including stuff that we're, we're still resolving or have only resolved very, very recently. Perhaps the most famous of these is a thing called Dinochirus, okay. which has been knocking around since, oh, mid-50s, I think? Oh, don't pin me down on that date exactly. A dino Not in the Jurassic Park film, though, so therefore doesn't exist no, for most people. No, no. Dinochirus was found and known from a pair of gigantic arms. Absolutely enormous. They're they're like two plus meters long with big claws on the end of them. And they were very obviously from a theropod. And that's all we knew. I've got so many books that I had when I was a kid and Dinocaris was just the arms. And everyone was like, oh my God, you know, this thing is going to be like twice the size of T-Rex if we ever find the rest of it. Don't, don't they have them up in the um, in the Natural History Museum? Isn't there one? Yes. Because yeah. I remember seeing that. Yeah. Yep. There's a pair of arms on the wall. Uh, there are casts of these arms arms absolutely everywhere and this was like the great lost giant theropod of Mongolia and no one knew quite what it was the best guess going into the kind of 90s and early 2000s was a thing called an ornithomimid or an ornithomimosaur um, which is a name that most people probably aren't familiar with but everyone's seen Jurassic Park and Gallimimus the all the dinosaurs are flocking this way and they run away and the big group of them run past and they all look a bit like ostriches those your ornithomimid and it was supposed to be just an absolutely giant ornithomimid wow. i mean two or three times the size of any previous one and the big ones you know three meters to the top of the head so this thing is going to be colossal after much scratching around a uh, team i think out of belgium went back and incredibly found the original site that the arms came from and that most of the rest of the animal was still there what so, yeah, 50, 60 years after Dinocaris had been dug up and described, it turns out there was plenty more of it. And when it came through, Dinocaris is indeed a giant ornithomimid. So tick, well done, researchers, for getting that from just a pair of battered arms. But it's unbelievably weird. So <laughs> ornithomimids, as we say, you know, they're basically ostriches, more or less. They're, you know, long necked. Uh, with a little head, eating seedy type stuff, big long legs, running very, very fast. But ostriches don't have arms. <laughs> uh, well, they do have wings, obviously. <laughs> uh, which actually, ostriches still have claws on their wings as well, which no one realises. Well, see, the trouble with this podcast is afterwards, me and Dave chat for far too long about dinosaurs and go, we're not recording this, what a shame. But you yeah. sent me to a link and I, I, I saw these. And they have, you think, oh yeah, they've got you know feathers that look a bit like claws. No, they have actual claws. 
ostriches, little black yeah. ones. <laughs> Schnicky de schnick. Yeah, and quite sharp. Um, so yeah, ornithomimids, big ostriches. Dinochirus, absolutely massive and really chunky. This thing is never going to be quick. It is a huge, huge animal and it's built very kind of bulky. It's not going to be a fast animal. It has a giant hump over its back. So there's a whole, actually a whole bunch of dinosaurs which are kind of sail-backed with really elongate parts of the backbone that stick up and give them a kind of sail. Spinosaurus is the really obvious one, but there's actually a whole load of different dinosaurs that do this. And it turns out Dinochirus is another one, and we didn't know the Ornithomimids did that. So that's kind of weird. Um, and then its head is really weird. It's huge, much bigger than you'd expect for the size of the animal, even a very big thing. And basically, its lower jaw is bigger than its skull. So... <laughs> Yeah, I know. So, like, you know, most animals, most of the head is, like, the upper part. You know, it's got your eyes, it's got your nose, it's got your brain. It's usually got all the anchorage for all the jaw muscles. And then the lower jaw is obviously a much smaller part of that. Well, in this case, the lower jaw is this giant boat-like thing. And there's a really squidged little bit on top. I'm I'm exaggerating a bit, but not by much. It, It is surprisingly even top and bottom in terms of size. So I'm, I'm imagining a sort of pelican, but with a solid jaw, or is it not that deep? How It's almost like it's got... And, and its head is really square-shaped as well. So it's almost like... Imagine a shoebox where, <laughs> the, you know, the top bit has got that you'd normally lift off has the eyes and nose in it, and the bottom bit is the lower jaw. That is, again, exaggerated, but that's almost what the head of Dinochirus looks like. What? Oh, God, is this thing weird? Well, and then that's the other, other, other weird thing about it. This specimen was really well preserved. So I'm told on the paleo grapevine, there are supposedly more specimens coming out with relatively complete chunks of skeletons. The chest cavity contained bits of fish. Now, it's always possible that an animal that died in a river, various, you know, there's fish around, there's dead fish around, bits will end up there. Um, but it is not impossible this is some kind of weird fish eater. Uh, we know at least one early ornithomimid, which was also itself probably eating fish, in fact, was a filter feeder. So it's not that weird if this is some kind of big marshy animal that's getting water plants and fish and stuff. So it is a, it is like a pelican in that it might just take a scoop of water and then, you know, see what it gets out of it. Or... Yeah, it, it, like there's one paper describing this thing and it's not that detailed and that's that's not to do disrespect to the people who did it, but, you know, this is the kind of thing which at some point we're expecting, you know, like a 200-page, every bit of the anatomy detailed in great length, and that hasn't appeared yet. So if the arms are two metres long and it's got spines on top of its back as well, so it's going to look really tall and it's got this massive digger front to it with a big bottom home. How, how big was its skull? How big is this thing? Oh, st- still, still, I mean, the skull's still not big, you know, okay. 50-ish centimetres. So okay. it's not like some giant, yeah, giant... I, know. I, was, I was thinking. I was thinking. How big is it for an ornithomimid? Where you know a big one that's three, three and a half meters tall. The head is still like fifteen, twenty centimeters. Aww. To then and you know and very ostrichy and you know really giant eyes and then just a little beak at the front. To have a head this big and square, you know, is three or four times the size of what you'd really predict. If you just scaled and gallimimus up, it would not look like that. Very weird. Um, so yeah, so it's this boxy headed kind kind of short-necked, hump-backed, slow, sluggish, possible fish eater is everything not what the, you know, later ornithomimids should look like and should be doing. Why would it have that fan thing? Yeah, we don't know. Um, It's notable that at least a few of these animals are desert dwellers, or at least, and again, desert immediately makes everyone think, you know, middle of the Sahara. Middle of the Sahara is really quite weird for a desert. Um, You know, various bits of desert are really quite green and have, you know, the banks of the Nile are extremely fertile, even if months you go not too far from that, that stops being the case. Um, But these are certainly relatively hot, dry environments. We think of dinosaurs as being, inverted commas, warm-blooded, so they have a mammal or a bird-like physiology. They stay hot all the time, but that doesn't mean that um, regulating the temperature wouldn't be important. So Spinosaurus, desert dweller, uh, there's thing called Aranosaurus, which lives alongside Spinosaurus. Um, it's It's an iguanodontid has a big spine, uh, you know, a 
this spine fan on the back. So does Dinochirus. Um, now, there's plenty of others that don't live in desert, but it's still notable that kind of three of the biggest examples are all relatively hot, dry environment livers, even if Spinosaurus is probably doing a lot of stuff in and around water. So maybe there's some temperature regulation so it's like a radiator. built in there somewhere. Well, it, it could be either. It could be used to warm up, so pick up early morning sun, or of course it could be used to cool down if you know if there's a good breeze and you can stand parallel to the sun then suddenly you have sorry perpendicular to the sun then suddenly you have very little cross-sectional area so you're not getting much heat from the sun but a huge amount of side area from which you can bleed heat out um so it it could go either way of course um the other obvious thing which we know is not mutually exclusive is it some kind of signaling structure yes it's some but some kind of deflect it like like you get with some some lizards are able no these are these are these are solid plates of bone in Mm. in every case um so yeah they're they're not doing anything and dinochorus is just the first of several weird things from mongolia go on then give me another thurizinosaurus thurizinosaurus and thurizinosaurus translates as the scythe lizards so start with your average ornithomimid because hopefully people have got that ostrich-like appearance in their head Mm. make him really kind of fat and barrel chested with okay. really stumpy legs okay i'm thinking now of sort of a goose turkey yeah turkey and goose kind of body plan okay yeah, absolutely on there and then relatively big well muscled arms with giant and i really can't emphasize this enough claws on them and when i say giant i mean 60 plus centimeters just for the claw bone then of course it would have the sheath on top of it how big is the rest of the dinosaur though so uh, a big there is a big Therizinosaurus is a big animal. It's it's going to be... It, so it has a more kind of upright posture, it's like kind of goose-like, probably three and a half metres to the top of the head. Okay. But, but still, a claw that's with the sheath 80 centimetres? That's... Three feet long, abso- and three on each hand. You know, this is absolutely what? absurd. Uh, and it's a herbivore. It's got a little <laughs> stumpy head and a beak. Yeah, I know. I know. This is the thing. They're weird as hell. Uh, just to make them a bit more fun, as a slight side note, when they were described, or when they were first discovered, uh, someone thought it was a giant terrapin. <gasps> because of the claws. Which so the the name is um, Thurizinosaurus chiloniformis, turtle shaped, and that would then really throw people. Except if you know your freshwater terrapins or freshwater turtles for the North Americans, and indeed the um, quite a lot of them actually have really really long flat claws on their hands. They're really you have quite... to give them rocks so that they can sharpen them on and get rid of them if you keep them. Yes, I know that. <laughs> but yeah, you you get you know really really big claws on very small little terrapins, and someone found just this set of claws out in this environment and there's loads of turtle shells and skulls and bits of bone out there and again this is 1930s i think it actually doesn't sound that stupid to suggest that someone had found a giant freshwater terrapin later they found more of it and realized it was a dinosaur and but the name still honors that um but yeah just this enormous set of ludicrous claws on this otherwise fat plant-eating goose thing you're you're describing a lot of women i've met in nail bars right now this is you do guess (laughs) you get get ridiculously long nails there but i can't i just don't understand why why would this thing have them we really don't know so there's a bunch of therizinosaurs we now know we've got a pretty good idea about them there's um throughout asia and north america and some other places they often have fairly big claws but nothing even close to therizinosaurus itself this is so far out of what the others have and there's two general conclusions that are applied to this. First of all, it's some kind of giant leaf rake, which sounds ridiculous, but it's not impossible. They've got, they've got long arms, relatively long arms. If they're reaching up into trees with these claws and using them to hook around and pull down branches and get hold of stuff, um, that is at least plausible. Giant sloths. So yeah, the extinct just giant sloths. sloths have really big claws on the hands they're, we know they're reaching up into trees it's quite possible that therizinosaurs have you know there's convergence and they're doing something similar that has to be a strong tree though to hold up a dinosaur well there's not they're climbing so much as just I like know. you know hooking onto a branch 
and pulling it down a bit. Um, but the, the second suggestion is that these are some kind of anti-predator defense. Um, you know, if you're this really big, fat, slow herbivore, there are tyrannosaur relatives running around which are faster than you and bigger than you and much, much toothier than you. And being able to stand there and brandish these claws and swipe at things is probably a fairly good defense. So are they adamantian, the sexoskeleton of the... <laughs> is it Wolverine? <laughs> there are some uh, fun illustrations where people have strategically coloured their Thurizinosaurus to match Wolverine <laughs> co comic costumes. <laughs> so other people People have got to this first. Um, but the, yeah, the other thing is it's potential anti-predator. And if you look at things like uh, anteaters, this is exactly what they do. If you threaten an anteater, they stand up on their back legs, rear up and pull their claws out and then slash at things. And most things, that really kind of puts them off. The difference is anteater claws are extremely strong and thick and powerful because they're digging into termite mounds. And Thurizinosaurus claws are actually really thick thin like a centimeter centimeter and a half thick uh at the base and about halfway down now that sounds like quite a lot but obviously you've got a leverage problem if you've got something that's three quarters of a meter long but only a centimeter wide it's going to be very vulnerable to twisting and breaking if it gets stuck in something or hits something i'm just thinking the which level... you think an anti-predator spike might do i'm just thinking the level of like nail varnish and strengthening solution that you need on these because you know you just do a bit of typing or you flick a light switch they're gonna snap pretty much so that would suggest that the anti-predator thing is you know kind of secondary um because they can't be that much of a defense because they probably just break and okay they might do some real injury in the meantime and that might be enough to put predators off but you'd expect these to be rather thicker and stronger were there like lots of leaves on the ground or something they could be raking through making building nests or maybe just looking for worms or massive were they giant worms is that they could eat uh, not that I'm aware of right around then it is a real mystery like why have they got three claws yeah. um, so a lot of these you know a lot of other animals have reduced their hands down at this point they've got you know one big claw yeah, anteaters have one big claw and then the others are much smaller all you're doing is raking a few leaves or all you're doing is trying to poke a carnivore one claw might do it yeah it, they're weird I, don't, I basically don't think we know okay give me another give me another weird diet dinosaur while we're on weird dinosaurs Go on. well we're on weird claws and finger reduction it's the alvarosaurs so this is a group i i love i've done a fair bit of work on alvarosaurs when i was based in china we found two new species and i helped write them up and name them um and do some work on their what, ecology what did you name them uh so one is called linhonychus monodactylus because it has one finger which is as far as we know the only one fingered dinosaur was it the middle finger was it really angry um no <laughs> No, it's 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 index. the equivalent of the index finger. Ah. Oh, or is it a thumb? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, well, there, 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 I mean, there's a. In, we could do three or four hours worth of discussion as to the identity of fingers in dinosaurs. No, we couldn't get on with it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let's not do that. Um, it's it's one of the first two fingers, depending on how you count them. Other uh, it was Linhonychus, and the other one was Shishionychus from Shishia, unsurprisingly. So Shishia's claw yeah. and Linher's claw, because these are the place they were from. Um, so the alvarosaurs mostly are tiny, like chicken size. They're about the smallest dinosaurs that we have oh. at adult. So 40, 50 centimeters long, including oh. the tail. So probably 30 centimetres to the top of the head, and that's standing up quite tall with a relatively long neck. So my cats uh, could get them. So squirrel-sized, really, but yeah. squirrel, squirrel with long leg size. And a long neck, yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, small magpie size, pretty much. Um, so again, built like the ornithomimid, so, you know, shrink an ostrich down, so it's still relatively leggy and a big long neck and a relatively small little head. So cute. You've pretty much got an alvarosaur. Um, and that they've got a wonderfully quirky history. Um, I want to talk about their feet in a bit, but as a okay. side note, they have these odd little foot bones. There were some alvarosaurs, which we, well, what we now know to be alvarosaurs from Eastern Europe, that were dug up in late 1800s, early 1900s, and were misdiagnosed as giant Cretaceous owls <laughs> um, because they happened to have something in common with owl foot bones. And of course, this was a group that no one had ever heard of, that no one knew about. We didn't understand the evolutionary history of birds, and there was this idea of some well not necessarily giant but certainly owls running around in the cretaceous at one point and these were based on alvarosaur feet alvarosaurs we now have are actually a really interestingly complicated 
biogeographic history. So they basically seem to have crossed multiple times from Asia into North America and back again. Animals regularly cross into other places. Asia and North America are not that far apart now and were closer back then. But, you know, a group went from Asia into North America, split up into a few species. One of those species went back into Asia, diversified a few more species. One of those went back into North America again. Um, in the meantime, with some going into Europe and others going into South America. Um, so they've got this wonderfully convoluted history of kind of running around and not exactly crossing oceans, but certainly getting from continent to continent. But alvarosaurs are anteaters. That's basically what they are. They're <gasps> dinosaurian anteaters. But they didn't have the long nose. But they don't have the long nose, unfortunately. But they have a whole bunch of stuff in common with ant-eating and termite-eating and small insect-eating animals. Do they have the long tongue? They don't have the long nose and they don't have the long tongue. But what they do have is a very small and rounded beak... Uh, and with really simplified and reduced teeth, which is really common among things eating soft-bodied stuff like termites and ants and spiders and stuff like that. There's things like uh, Moloch, which is the thorny devil from Australia. That's an anteater. And yeah, it basically just picks them up pretty much one at a time. Alvarosaurs are probably doing something like that. So rather than a big tongue to hoover up loads, it's pecking away very quickly. Small animals, not going to need need very much. And the weird thing about them, so we already mentioned, Linhonychus monodactylus, it's got one finger so they really reduce their hands down to basically one huge fat finger with a big fat claw on it and then the other fingers just get smaller and smaller and smaller and in linhonychus they're gone so they've got this giant fat single massive bone in the palm of the hand single couple of fat bones supporting this giant claw this is really common in things that are digging because they're putting a lot of energy in and then the arms are actually really quite short but they're stupidly powerful and they have this weird jutting out of the elbow so basically you know you, you kind of fold your arm into a proper l shape imagine if your elbow just kept going out the back of your arm oh, wow. and what that basically gives you is a giant lever and it gives you a lot of power and pretty much all diggers have this lever aardvarks anteaters pangolins armadillos moles anything doing this kind of work extends that they make the humerus the upper arm bone a really weird shape and they extend this lever off the elbow so like really good triceps oh yeah 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 and so it's a little it's basically a little kind of hugging action they're, they're sticking the claws into something and then pulling their arms back towards themselves and that will break into and lever open very tough things. So don't get hugged by an alvarosaurus because you get ripped into. Well, f fortunately, as we say, they're tiny, or most of them are tiny. Some are pretty big. Um, but yeah, that that's pretty neat. Um, they're probably not eating termites, or at least termite mounds, termite mound building termites, don't appear to have been around then. Oh. But they could still have been levering the bark off trees and breaking into trees and, you know, digging up ant nests and bees and wasps and all kinds of stuff like this. This is probably what they're after. Um, and it's not just the arms. There's a, actually a whole suite of adaptations that go through the body. So, you know, your, your vertebrae, so your, the bones in your back, in your spine, uh, you basically have a big chunk at the bottom, um, which is basically supporting the weight, and then some complicated stuff off the top with a couple of little pads that overlap each other, front and back, to give you some support, but also some flexibility. Um, and that's really, really normal, except the um, alvarosaurs, in common with a bunch of other groups, but very unusual for a theropod, have an extra little attachment. It's this thing called the hypersphene hypantrum articulation. And all that really means is that it helps lock their spine together and make it less flexible. Now that sounds like an odd thing to do, but if you can imagine you're trying to dig into something really, really hard, you're applying a huge amount of power to a single point, to one claw, and, you know, that force will take the path of least resistance. And so if you have a very flexible spine or very flexible legs, what will bend is your body and not the rock you're trying to dig into. Whereas if you can lock your body together and make it super static and solid, then what will give way first is the thing you're trying to dig into. Wow. So even though they're these tiny little dinosaurs, they have this extra back stiffening, which normally we only see in some of the biggest sauropods, which which of course absolutely enormous and they're doing it to hold their damn weight up these guys are doing it because they're 
digging. And then the last thing they have, so this is a paper I was involved in and I helped sculpt this side of our interpretation of their ecology, is their legs are built like long distance runners. They're actually really efficient at running around. And believe it or not, although they don't look it when they get motoring, aardvarks and anteaters have something quite similar. They, they, and aard wolves, which are a kind of hyena, they're built basically for long distance travel. Now that's normal if what you're doing is exploiting what we'd say in ecological terms, a patchy resource. So what anteaters and aardvarks don't do is they don't go up to a termite mound or an ant nest and absolutely destroy it and eat all of the ants because it'll be years before they'll ever be able to eat from that again what they're much better off doing is knocking a hole in it eating a whole bunch of them and making sure that that nest survives i'll come back later thank you can you please breed more thank you yeah but also depending on how bad the you know defenses are you don't want to hang around forever and just get more and more (laughs) stung or bitten and so what they do is they'll break open eat a whole bunch of them and then travel probably a couple of miles to the next nest because of course These things aren't right next to each other. And so they move from site to site to site. Their diet is actually relatively low energy and they've got to travel quite a long distance. That's got to be depressing for the termites or the ants though because they think they've won. They think, yes, we've (laughs) defeated it. Well done us. Yay, we've won. And then a couple of months later, it's... Someone's coming back after you later. Ah! Just as you finish rebuilding. Yep. Jeez, that's depressing. Poor termites. (laughs) Oh, well. They've they've done all right out of it, to be honest. Termites are doing pretty well in the grand scheme of things. I think so, yeah. (laughs) But yeah, so that's what alvarosaurs are doing. There are these little ant-eating or equivalent-eating dinosaurs, which are really efficient long-distance runners and have these digging but tiny arms. Alvarosaurs, I tell you what, look, I'm distracted. Let's move on to another place because that was all from Mongolia. So how about about closer, because we always hear about Americans, so no T-Rexes, please. Yeah, it, it... It's kind of worth, it is a point kind of worth making because, yeah, there's so much famous stuff from North America, you know, T-Rex, Triceratops, Stegosaurus, China and Mongolia have some truly weird stuff, South America has produced some absolute of the giants, and Europe kind of gets a bit left, you know, oh, we got Iguanodon and Megalosaurus, they're kind of medium size and they're not that interesting, I think is often what people think of, and not the case, Um, uh, and there's some lovely, lovely weirdness coming out of Europe, particularly in recent years, Um, and most mostly from islands. So, of course, the world now is not as the world was then. True. And Europe was at various times... Yep. Europe was at various times mostly underwater and large chunks of it were formed islands. And island faunas, if we look at the modern world, island faunas are often really weird because they're cut off from the rest of the world and whatever species got there early have to, you know, can adapt and expand. You know, Galapagos finches, absolute classic example of that. But... There's a reason you get giant tortoises on islands. There's a reason the lemurs are now only on Madagascar and have diversified to produce lots of weird things. The Okay, Australia's a bit different because it's an island continent, but the marsupials there, all kinds of weird flightless birds in Hawaii, New Zealand, flightless parrots, kiwis, kiwis, the St. Stephen Island wren, so the only flightless perching bird. Islands generally produce loads of weird stuff. And it's perhaps no surprise that when we can identify fossil record islands, the dinosaurs on them are weird. (laughs) And one example of that is from Germany, and it's a thing called Europosaurus. So this is the... That's named after Europe. Well, well spotted. So it's uh, in, in latest Jurassic, mm-hmm. and Europosaurus is basically a, a brachiosaurid. So brachiosaurus, one of the sauropods, but in particular, very upright, very tall neck with the head with the big kind of bulbous lump in the middle of it. Brachiosaurs generally massive. Even by sauropod standards, the brachiosaurs are huge. Europosaurus, three, three and a bit metres to the top oh. of the head. It's about as small as sauropods get. That's lovely. And remember, a good chunk of that height is going to be neck. Yeah. This is pretty much a rhino-sized sauropod with a neck and a tail, which is tiny for sauropods. I mean, almost unimaginably small. It's about a third of a dippy. If less. In terms of mass, much, much less. One big factor of islands is big things get small because there's not much food, and so for a viable population, they tend to shrink. So red deer on the Isle of Wight, for example, are much smaller than red deer in Scotland. 
We used to have dwarf elephants in Crete, which is quite cool. Um, <laughs> if you go if you go back up, it's just a few hundred thousand years, I think. Relatively recent. So big things get small, and then small things get big, which is why we tend to get things like giant tortoises. And we'll get onto that with another dinosaur island in a minute. Oh, and just for the record, because I have to bring this up. So Crete had miniature dwarf elephants, but it also had giant swans. So you had this position where there were <laughs> swans bigger than elephants running around, which is just fantastic. And These are not dinosaurs. These are not dinosaurs. I'm ruling out this conversation back to Europosaurus. Come on. <laughs> Sw- swans are dinosaurs. But, uh, <laughs> True. Um, but yeah, Europa- well, that's pretty much all I've got to say about Europosaurus, yeah. but just it's because it's island dwarfism and you've got this absolute tiny miniature weird brachiosaur. I mean, it's just the right height to take a ride on the back. And, yeah, you know. probably. I mean, yeah, there's, there's that shot in the last Jurassic World, or even the first Jurassic World, where I think they've got like they've got like the kiddie petting zoo for the dinosaurs, and there's like a baby brachiosaur. That's pretty much how big Europosaurus is as adult. It's absolutely incredible. That's very cool. And it's not the only example. So a much better one where we've got much more fauna is uh, what is now Rumania. Romania, and so Transylvania as was, it's, it's the Transylvania Basin, and in the late Cretaceous, this was a series of big islands in a sea, and everything from there pretty much is weird. Um, we have some more island dwarfism, so there's a uh, Paludi Titan, which is another Good dwarf night. sauropod, not much bigger than Europosaurus. Uh, there's a thing called Telmatosaurus, which is a miniature duckbill. Tomatosaurus is pretty big, and it's five-ish metres long, with, again, a lot of tail. But for a hadrosaur, that's, particularly in the late Cretaceous, that's absolutely tiny. And then there's Balur. Balur? Balur, B-A-L-U-U-R. So Balur is about as odd as dinosaurs get. So I happen to get a very early sneak preview of Balur um, because one of the people who was working on it uh, from the American Museum of Natural History um, was in China while I was in China and showed me a couple of photos. And he said, we found this really cool new therizinosaur because look, it's got four big toes. And you're like, okay, that's cool because all the other theropods walk on three toes and therizinosaurus has kind of reincorporated one of its toes and they, they kind of walk on four. Um, and then they found out that, oh my God, no, the reason it looks like it's got kind of four walking toes is because actually it hasn't. Now, I need to dial back a little bit and talk about Velociraptor and its kin. Okay. Now, so Velociraptor walks on two toes. Because it's got that big hooky one for stabbing. Because it's got the right, right. So they still, so their fifth toe is gone. Their little toe has vanished. That's really quite common in, in theropod. Their first, the thumb, or big toe equivalent, sits quite a long way back up the leg, just like the dew claw on a dog. It's not really kind of connected to the walking toes anymore, but it's still there. And that's there in pretty much all theropods, except a couple of alvarosaurs, actually. Um, so little little kind of big, big toe, we'll call it thumb just because it's easier to think about it in your hand, stuck halfway up the arm. Then the what would be the index finger? Stabby, stabby, stab. The second toe is the one with the big claw, which is lifted off the ground. And then they walk on the two toes next to it. Mm. So they basically walk on two toes like ostriches do. Now, the reason they thought that Belur was a therizinosaur and walking on four toes is that thumb, that first big toe that should sit halfway up the arm, has basically migrated back down to where it would have been 150 million years earlier, sits alongside the second one, and also has the giant hook claw on it. So it's basically got a double scythe claw on the toe, and then is walking on the other two toes. So it's like this, yeah, double raptorial clawed velociraptor. And that's what it was originally described as, is a, it's really quite big um it's humanish sized or getting on for so four and a half five feet to the top of the head so way way bigger than velociraptor this would be a big sized carnivore that you're not going to want to run into and it was described as a dromaeosaur so velociraptor deinonychus and these other animals with this giant double claw some more detailed studies have come out since and Belur has now shifted. And it's not a huge shift evolutionarily because still pretty close actually to the dromaeosaurs, but it's gone across a pretty critical boundary. And that boundary is the line that we call birds. 
The best evidence at the moment is Balur is not a kind of fairly big, weird dromaeosaur. It is a giant, flightless, double-clawed early bird. <laughs> How how what so what is what is the thing that makes it a bird and not a dinosaur? Oh, uh, just a whole ton of anatomical characteristics. Okay. Um, we, yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk about this at some point. I'm like how we got... work out these evolutionary relationships? Yeah, I know we've we've only got so many hours in a day. I know. But basically, the the evolutionary reconstruction of all its detailed anatomy, and we're talking about literally thousands of little data points that people have gathered from the skeleton, put it well past the bird line, which means that it's secondarily flightless. It would have been a bird. Its ancestors were birds. Its ancestors were flying. And it has lost that capacity. It's perhaps the earliest record of the reacquisition of flightlessness. There were other flightless birds around at this point, I should say. Mm. I'm talking about its lineage rather than it as an individual, which is a slight subtlety. Yeah. It was around longer, but because of its evolutionary history, you think it's quite an early animal or its lineage is an early animal. But yeah, it's a record of birds becoming flightless and then becoming giant and then reacquiring these giant foot claws and then expanding them and pushing the first one back round. This this sounds like a silly question. Did it have a beak or did it have teeth? Or did it have beak with teeth? I can't remember if it's got a skull or not. Because again, not every skeleton comes... (laughs) Well, obviously it had a skull. (laughs) Not every skeleton comes with all of the bits. I'm pretty sure there's bits of skull with teeth. You've got to remember, teeth were hanging okay. around in birds for really quite a long time. Well, yeah, you can get chickens with teeth, can't you? Uh, not quite. Um, you can get their, they get a ridge beak. <laughs> well, we, we still have various ducks and geese and things. Uh, Magansas have that. And then there's a whole lineage oh, yeah. of birds um, uh, in the last 50 million years called the, um, the pseudo-toothed birds. And they had really big spiky ridges that make them you know, like almost fanged birds, but they, it's just a modern modification of the bone there's no true teeth with enamel and sockets and all the rest of it there um but yeah Belur, i'm pretty sure had had teeth i'll have to check that and put something in the show notes also i quite like it because it sounds like a really sort of posh or slightly sexy baloo the bear Belur. hello i'm Belur. I'm Belur. <laughs> i think we've got time we've got time for possibly one more thing one more weird thing um and until we got our guest on who can ask us their question so well, what do you want? I was going to go back. So I, I talked about Alvaris or feet and then completely failed to follow up on that story, which I think is a really nice bit of sh- showing kind of how we understand biomechanics. And, and, you know, people often ask, like, how on earth can you work this out about dinosaurs? So Alvarosaurus is the um, is the little anteater one. Yes. With the, with the pointy elbows. And so you wouldn't want to come across them in the supermarket because they just elbow you out the way and you'd, you know, you'd get, get sore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, um, so it had its bracing back and it had its and its very efficient running. Uh, what's yeah. weird about its feet? So, so it's the efficient running thing. That that's the bit I want to talk about because that actually ties into so many different groups that we've mentioned today and even stuff we've said in previous episodes. So, I think it's okay. a, it's a really nice thing. And actually, we just talked about it in terms of feet. So, most nearly all theropods are running around on three toes. Their middle three toes and they're they're bird like um so their 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 toes are flat on the ground and then the bit which makes up the majority of our foot is lifted off the ground and so it kind of extends the the length of the leg and those three bones in birds they actually fuse together into a single giant block um but in the theropods they're still separate bones and each of them is a fairly simple, slightly squarish, I was going to say squarish tube. They're kind of like, uh, if you've got some old Smarties tu- uh, tubes or chewits or something like that and push the three together, they're fairly blocky and they sit side by side. And most of the time, they're not particularly interesting. Mm-hmm. But a whole bunch of different theropod groups have independently changed that quite dramatically in the same way. The Alvarosaurs did it, a group called the Truodontids, which are very close to dromaeosaurs and birds did it. The ornithomimosaurs, which we've just been talking about, did it. Um, and so too did tyrannosaurs and a couple of others. So like five or six times independently over about 100 million years, all these all these different theropod groups fundamentally changed them. And what they did is of those three square-like rods of bone, the middle one basically turned into a triangle or a little pyramid in, 
in if you looked at it head on the middle one is triangular and the other two slap either side of it so the foot still i mean the feet always splayed out a little but it, the middle one is really really squished and this is called an arctometatarsal pinched foot is what it's basically saying now the reason all these different groups did that is it can i can i guess it is it because they were wearing really tight pointy shoes is that what was happening is that why they no oh shut up carry on why, <laughs> it, why? it was it was a, it was a fantastic guess and yet completely wrong um <sighs> Again, what that does, imagine if you're running around and animals that run, and obviously that's most animals, um, you're very interested in or any kind of activity. You want to, you know, be efficient. You don't want to just waste energy. And if you're putting your foot down with the whole weight of your body, and if you're a very heavy animal like a tyrannosaur, or if you're a very fast moving animal like an ornithomimosaur, there's quite a lot of energy going into that. And what you want that energy to be doing is compressing things like your ligaments and tendons because they're pretty elastic. So they will compress. And as you step off, they will decompress. Oh, ping forwards. And you will get some energy back. It's, it's, an, it's a basic energy recovery system. And most things have a version of this. But one thing that will dissipate that is, same with the alvarosaurs digging, any way that the energy can basically escape. And again, you, this is your foot. This is the bit that's contacting the ground. And those three bones, if they're just, you know, little, um, you know, cubic columns, rectangular columns, side by side, those will shuffle past each other a little bit. And the energy will just go into the, sh the bones themselves rather than pinging back. Yeah, and cartilage and other stuff, and just be lost. But if you squeeze the middle one to turn this into this arctometatarsal, you can basically lock it shut in the ones either side. And now the foot bones can't move. I've got hold of relatively big tyrannosaur feet. And that it's more complicated than I'm describing. The middle one is often quite wavy and quite sinusoidal. And these things, when you finally fit them together, they, they physically like lock in place. It's genuinely quite hard to move them. It's like a so complicated it's like little thing. They lace shoe. their own shoes up in a, in a sense. They're getting really sort of like they're binding their own feet together. That is a decent analogy. Yeah. And so that's a big energy saver. And so if you want to be fast like an ornithomimid or you want to be efficient like an alvarosaur or a tyrannosaur and we've talked about t-rex being this great long distance runner this is a big thing that you can do to reclaim energy with every step and so it evolves again and again and again and whenever we see it you can point to it and go that is a real efficiency thing and it's usually tied to long distance running rather than speed per se have you been able to look at this in the footprints they leave behind the difference between running and walking and it can you actually see the you know the, the fingers coming together as it were the toes coming together you you won't see any effect of of the arctometatarsus and differences between those that do and don't have it what we do see though is some of that swaying so a, a friend of mine uh, peter falkingham who's up at liverpool john moores pete has done some of the most amazing work on footprints for dinosaurs that's ever been done and one of the big things we had is that there was a whole bunch of stuff which were described as swimming traces so the idea was that this animal was swimming through swimming in water and the, the feet were just kind of catching the bottom of the of the mud and so oh, leaving cool. these like these little like scratches just from the tips of the toes now there are some which are almost certainly that but actually what most of them are is an animal wading through mud and actually you're, you're not you what it looks like is a pair of is a set of little lines where the foot's just hit the surface but what it actually is and we've all done this when you've walked in really really properly muddy stuff yeah. your foot goes in and then it comes back out with a huge and then the, the thing collapses in on itself and you'd never have realized that there was a proper footprint there beyond the fact that everything's just all kind of messed up well if you've got the right sediment thickness uh, and the right density of it then when that thing has dried up and then you can either section it and cut through it or scan it. You can actually see and track the disturbance of the individual mud layers. Oh, and you wow. can actually see the foot go in, the toes spread out under loading. And then as it lifts off and walks forwards, the toes will then drag through the mud and pull back together as the foot lifts out. That's so cool. Exactly like a bird. Very, very unsurprisingly. But the toes splay out as it hits the ground 
around and they pull back together as it lifts up. And you can track that through these, some cases, 200 million year old footprints and see that that's how the feet are working. Very, very quickly, um, um, the sauropods and everything else, because we're used to elephants and always sort of imagine their feet to be more like elephant and rhino feet. Are they? <sighs> Four feet mostly are not. I think we touched on this last week with yeah. the kind of horseshoe-shaped hands. The hind feet are more elephant-like, where they have the toes are quite... Say so elephants, people think elephants are flat-footed and they're not. So yeah, elephants actually tip-toes. stand on their toes and then have this giant pad of kind of fat Flesh. behind and underneath the foot to turn it into a giant... Like a bit like you've got on your heel, but thicker. Yeah, much, much, much thicker. Um, and sauropods are rather more like that. They're a little more flat-footed... Than and elephants are already, but their footprints show that there is a big, fat, round effect that they're standing And their front on. feet are different because they used to, they descend from animals which were like theropods and used to walk bipedally. Yeah, and so even though they're quadrupeds, most of their weight is closer to their pelvis than towards the front, or at least split down the middle. Most, some of the brachiosaurs are perhaps an exception. They have particularly large and strong forelimbs. So more of the weight, and again, more of the power generation because of the muscles the legs on the tail which you don't have on the arms um so yeah more weight at the back more power at the back so the arms aren't necessarily taking that much weight and doing that much drive um but yeah we get some cool sauropod footprints as well well i tell you what instead of talking about dinosaurs from places where you don't usually find them mongolia and europe why don't we find a dinosaur fan from somewhere completely different in the world let us go all the way to australia where we have the comedian the podcaster do listen to tea with alice if you can it's a great podcast and many others her her latest special is on amazon prime as we speak and down the line we have the magnificent it's alice fraser hello how are you i'm so oh, happy very, to be here very very Good well we're, we're so behind yeah. you you've already had your thursday we've got to get through it it's just <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, I'm, I'm nervous it's not bad it. before we you ask the dave your question are you a fan of dinosaurs were you ever interested in them growing up Yes. Oh, absolutely. I have always been fascinated by dinosaurs and I've always loved them. As a kid, I accidentally almost brained my twin brother by sticking him up the nose with the tail of a Diplodocus toy that I had. (laughs) Uh, I was just swinging it around wildly and he had a nosebleed and fainted and I thought I'd, I'd murdered him with a dinosaur. What a way Excellent. to go. Every So what 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 is your question you'd like to ask Dave? Dinosaurs, they were very big, right? <laughs> As a general yes. rule. Yes. Um if you recreated a dinosaur now, would it be as big? If you had the same genetic template, would it be as big? Ooh, um yes, good question. Uh the short answer is probably. Um so there's ideas that Back in the um, Mesozoic, when dinosaurs were around, there was massively elevated carbon dioxide, which meant much more plant productivity, which meant much more food available, and also suggested higher oxygen levels, which meant the animals could get bigger. Um, Those things are true a little, but they aren't anything like as much as is often quoted. Um, And equally, they wouldn't necessarily have anything like as big an effect as people have quoted. Uh, Yes, because what the thing that I'd heard was that, you know, there was so much oxygen around, they could get very big. And if you had a Tyrannosaurus rex now, it would be about the size of a horse. Uh, But I couldn't find any data to back that up. So I was hoping. Yeah, because it's not true. (laughs) (laughs) Good. (laughs) <laughs> that, that, would be, that would probably be the main reason for that. You know, if you fed these animals right, I don't think there's any particular reason that they wouldn't get to the same size now as they would have been capable then. And even then, you know, you, you talk about, you know, we talk about, you know, super giant animals, you know, the biggest thor- sauropods, Diplodocus and its kin, are in the 50 plus ton range. But there are tons and tons and tons of dinosaurs which are in the like one to ten ton range. And that's not far off modern mammals now. I mean, the, the world record for African elephants is something like seven and a half, eight tons. And only a few million years ago, where the atmospheric conditions were basically identical to what they are now, you had mammals that were ten plus tons. So even if you ignore the supergiant dinosaurs, the vast majority of them were within the scope of the kind of body masses that we at least see as being achievable by modern mammals in a modern world with a modern ecosystem and modern atmosphere. And therefore, yeah, it's 
there's no reason to think that you couldn't make Stegosaurus, Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus, Allosaurus, or any of these animals because they were in the reign of five to ten tons, and we know that's perfectly viable. So if they were going to do the the bringing them back to life Jurassic back Park style, <laughs> uh, then it would be big dinosaurs, not little mini dinosaurs. Yeah, if you if you magically, and that's pretty much the word at this point, because for all the claims <laughs> that people have made that we can resurrect dinosaurs, or that it's five years away, or that it's ten years away, it's a near infinite years away. Um, but yeah, if we could somehow do it, yeah, there's no reason that they're not getting up to full size with the right diet. But if we did do it, I mean, you would be very disappointed if you went to a Jurassic Park situation <laughs> and they were all small dinosaurs. Four foot high. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to see a Brachiosaurus and it barely comes up to your chin. That well, would be... well, no, no, no. All we just did, we only did the smaller dinosaurs. So that all the all the actual dinosaurs, which were the sort of <laughs> like, like little Velociraptors and little, because Velociraptors are smaller than the ones that they're depicted in the films, aren't they? Oh, they're a, they're a fraction of the size. I mean, they they barely reach your waist to the top of their head. Um, oh. They're they're tiny little animals. I, I the one thing I always get from kids whenever I do outreach events is because they've all seen the films. They go, "Would you be able to survive if you were attacked by a Velociraptor?" And it's like. There is a lot of claws on them, which were pretty nasty. And, you know, if, if having worked as a zookeeper, some small animals can pack really quite a punch. But the fact remains is a big velociraptor is like 15 kilos and I'm 100. So I'd like to think <laughs> that I can pretty much just fall on it and survive the outcome. So you'd probably rather have a fight with a velociraptor than with a diplodocus, is what you're saying? Uh, yes, <laughs> by some considerable margin. <laughs> Alice, is there a particular dinosaur that you'd like to fight? Oh, that I'd like to fight? No, I, I don't think I'd like. I'm not a very. I'm not a very warlike person. Oh. I'm not sure if I'd like to fight any uh, any animals at all. But I, I used to be obsessed with the Allosaurus just because it had the same name as me. Oh, of course. Oh. <laughs> but they're quite vicious, aren't they, Allosaurus? They look more like the Velociraptors in the films. Yeah. The, so uh, Allosaurus is. The nickname that it has is Lion of the Jurassic, which is probably a terrible nickname because I'm I'm not really sure what's that supposed to quite invoke. Um, but Did it was they a sleep big... in jungles. <laughs> if they slept in Tonight, jungles, possibly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean they're they're a good size. A big Allosaurus is ten meters or so, Whoa. and obviously a lot of that is tail. You're talking about an animal probably two two and a half tons. Not the kind of thing you really want to mess with, but there were definitely bigger predators around. I mean, there were bigger predators even in its own ecosystem. There's a thing called Torvosaurus, which is quite a lot bigger than Allosaurus. So it's not even the biggest predator when and where it lived. But they're rather they're rather fun. They're rather neglected because I think people's perception of Allosaurus is like this generic carnivore, and actually they're really quite weird in a whole bunch of ways. But no one ever talks about that. Tell me a weird thing about an Allosaurus. So they've got these really nice big pair of thin, triangular, spiky crests that sit above and just in front of the eyes. So almost every illustration of Allosaurus until the last few years, actually, that people have started to fix this, it just had a very generic, kind of smooth, carnivorous dinosaur head, whereas in fact it should have these two giant pointy crests over its eyes and then a little pair of bumpy ridges from those running down towards the, towards the nose. And everyone just completely ignores it, despite the fact that they're plain as day on every single well-preserved skull, um, <laughs> which is really a bit of a shame. We know that they beat each other up. So there's a specimen which sadly is in private hands, and I've asked to study it, and I've never got an answer from the owner, which is annoying, because I have seen it. It's a really big Allosaurus skull. I think it's one of the biggest known, and it's got a huge series of horrible infections up the side of its face. Those have eaten away into the bone, and there are like holes in the side of its head. But you can see Whoa. into those holes, and inside are a bunch of teeth from another Allosaurus. So we know exactly <laughs> what caused the injuries on the side of its face. Bitten by another one, ripped the teeth out of the one that bit it, and that led to this giant infection in its... And it's got two. It's got two teeth in the top part, kind of in front of the eye, and then two in the lower jaw as well. Imagine finding another Allosaurus skull missing those teeth. For those teeth. <laughs> those specific teeth. <laughs> the problem is they, they grow and shed their teeth all the time, so oh, that do wouldn't they? necessarily tell you very much. Yeah. I yeah, they're like crocodiles. They, they cycle through them constantly. Wow. That's, that's so every, cool. 
my actual obsession is with all of the big giant Australian sort of prehistoric Australian animals, your giant wombats and, and, and other things like that. Oh, yeah. I think You've they're got cool very, things very like Thylaco Leo knocking around and the giant wombats are absolutely phenomenal. We've got one in um, Cambridge, I think, has a giant wombat skeleton, an original one, which are very few outside of Australia. And yeah, it's absolutely magnificent. Yeah. With the, um, here's a question about the giant wombat, because I know wombats now, nowadays wombats, are the only creature on earth that does square poos. Poo, yes. Uh, because they have this sort of slit-shaped anus and this bony plate on their on their backside. So they do these little poos like Lego blocks. You can see them in the bush. Would the giant wombat have also done giant square poos? I don't know, but I know the man to ask. Um, so you want, to, you want to get hold of Jack Ashby, who's a friend of mine, who is a mammal worker who specialises in marsupials and is one of the curators at the Cambridge Museum, which has the giant wombat, which is who I went to visit when I saw it. So I have I a question. Um, is the Australian giant wombat bigger or smaller than the British giant beaver? Because oh, we had oh. giant beavers going around, which um, I don't, amuses me for the sake that they are giant beavers. I don't think the giant... <laughs> so there's, there's Paleocaster, which I think is the genus you're talking about. Paleocaster was a big beaver, but no, it's a fraction of the size of the giant wombat. Oh. They get those the beat us in everything, don't they? Colossal. Because wombats, they basically, for those of, you know, for the English people who don't know what a wombat looks like, they're basically, they look like a koala, but on all fours, and a bit more yeah. sort of grrr. So they're very solid, they're sort of yeah. a brick-shaped, very thuggy, yeah. but, but but sweet. They're very mm. determined, they're very gentle, but if you, for example, build a house in the way of where they normally walk, they will just dig through your house. <laughs> or, or in case of the giant wombat, step on it. So. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you accidentally hit a wombat with your car, your car's not coming off unscathed. Alice, um, are you satisfied with your Alisor and your giantism and your wombat questions? Wombats. <laughs> I'm so satisfied. Big thank you to Alice Fraser there. And we did actually speak to your wombat expert, didn't we, on the Twitters? Yeah, so I said Jack Ashby will be able to answer this. Jack Ashby could answer this because I <laughs> immediately went on Twitter. Were you able to build a wombat, a, a wombat poo house a giant with, with breeze block sized chunks of dung? So unfortunately not. There there are oh. prehistoric wombats and there are some big prehistoric wombats. The thing that I think Alice was thinking of and certainly I was thinking of is this animal called Diprotodon, which is, yeah, like an elephant-sized animal. And it's not a true wombat. It's oh. part of the... So wom, you describe wombats as being like, like stocky koalas. Actually, wombats and koalas are extremely close relatives and Diprotodon and some other giant animals are part of that group but they are not themselves true wombats and they don't have the weird bum plate and therefore not being wombats <laughs> and not having that unfortunately a it's not quite a giant wombat and b it's definitely not having square poo i just i just love the fact that in this episode you've wor learned words like um albasaurus also bum plate Play. so <laughs> don't say that. i never learn you nothing <laughs> If you've got any questions, do get in touch with us on Patreon. Also, um, you can all the emails and everything else are at the end of the episode. So listen to the end of the episode and then you'll get the emails on how to get in touch. But until then, we will be back next week, maybe with some more digging and the rest of it, some bones and stuff. So until then, will you please, um, I will say goodbye from Izzy. Rawr. And goodbye from Dave. Rawr. <laughs> that was a bit Cornish. Rawr. Was, arr. <laughs> well, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit Bristolian actually. So it could have been the Bristolian dinosaur. There you go. Cheers, Droid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. If you want Terrible Lizards to keep bringing you more information about the world of dinosaurs, then we need to hear from you. Send us your dinosaur drawings and ask us your questions via terriblelizards.co.uk. UK. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Find us on Patreon, Facebook, and at Izzy underscore Lawrence and at Dave underscore Hone on Twitter. Include the hashtag terriblelizards. We're hoping to bring you more and more, but we can only do that if we get enough listeners. So please like, share, and subscribe.